Andrew Bittaker is a self-professed sadist who, under the guise of a pseudonym, uses Quora to divulge his dark side, describing his fantasies and the abuses inflicted on people in real life in great detail. Let's investigate. If you enjoy internet mysteries and generally disturbing content, feel free to subscribe and turn on notifications for more content like this. You can also become a channel member for perks like uncut videos and early access, or check out my PayPal or click the thanks under this video if you'd like to leave me a tip. Thanks to anyone who considers this. This video will contain vague discussions of topics that might be triggering to some. Viewer discretion is advised. You can become a channel member to watch the uncut version of this video, which features extra details that were unsuitable for this cut. Thanks to Twitter user Royal with Geese for suggesting this topic. In April 2021, an anonymous man joined Quora under the pseudonym Andrew Bittaker. Their bio reads, This isn't my real name. I'm only here to talk about the dark side of me and I will avoid going into depth about the pro-social parts because it is important that I keep these two things separate. Andrew has posted 12 questions and 58 answers. I'm going to summarise these, starting with the less disturbing, though even the tamer ones are very messed up. But to give you an idea of where this is heading, the top four topics in the knows about section are murder, sadism, rape and torture. In different answers, he gives himself different accreditations, ranging from lifelong sadist and expert human trainer a peakerist and a retophonophile, meaning someone who has a paraphilia that centres around committing murder. This man is interested in just about any violent and disconcerting topic you can think of, and never misses the opportunity to describe his fantasies and real-life experience in great detail. He often refers to himself as a sadist and acknowledges he could be a psychopath and a narcissist too, though he's hesitant to self-diagnose. He admits that he has never truly cared about anyone. The people in his life exist only to benefit him, usually through their suffering and submission to him. He details this in relation to romantic relationships he has had. Romantic is probably the wrong word to use though, as he seems incapable of showing love and only ever gives a partner some level of affection when he's trying to manipulate them, which he believes he's very skilled at. His first answer was in response to a question asking why trauma bonds are so strong, and he describes intermittent reinforcement, a technique he clearly has personal experience with. Quote, the intermittent reinforcement schedule that is often used at the inception of a trauma bonding relationship results in the most enduring, trained behaviour and the most persistent mental states of submissiveness and learned helplessness. Add on basic human psychology as a means to cope with complete real or perceived powerlessness in an often but not necessarily prolonged abusive or traumatic situation, the victim is forced to empathise with and basically become dependent upon their abuser or captor. It can even involve forming an alliance with or an emotional bond of delusional love with the abuser or captor. This is a survival process, a way to out strategy. Unlike cases where victims may sneakily try to manipulate their kidnapper or whomever with their fake empathy, traumatic bonding isn't intentional from the victim's perspective. Needless to say, for an abuser, the incentives for achieving this mental state are broad. The victim can easily be manipulated and guilted into accepting progressively more degrading and limiting treatment, particularly if the abuser makes ample use of various psychological tools, such as gaslighting and playing hot and cold, basically anything which uses intermittent reinforcement or which plays upon human emotional needs. Relenting upon some awful torture or abuse, or even providing positive reinforcement through telling the victim that you love or care for them, or apologising to them, etc., could be all that it takes to provide the victim a flood of happiness neurochemically, which can pretty quickly become addictive given the context of abuse. 
Andrew elaborates more on gaslighting in his subsequent answers, quote, I gaslight everyone all the time, really. It's kind of automatic for me. I'm mostly just a sadistic asshole, and I don't mind being honest about that on here. I've even told people right to their faces exactly what I am and what I am doing and intend to do to them, and then I gaslight them about that and make them feel stupid and guilty so that I can console and eventually control them. I'm always on the lookout for other people's weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and even if I don't exploit them right then, I keep all of that information tucked away for later use. Gaslighting is fun in and of itself, but it is also a great tool to use when testing a person's boundaries and mental strength, which is important in dating relationships. I want to know what sort of damaged goods I'm dealing with. Andrew likes to befriend people, get them to trust him and open up to him, providing him with valuable information that he can make a note of and use against them in the future, all the while pretending to be vulnerable himself and using techniques like mirroring to create a sense of rapport that he will eventually take great pleasure in destroying. He usually chooses people who he believes will be easy targets, Insecure, unconfident, weak-willed, people who were abused as children, are susceptible to flattery and attention. Most have been diagnosed with one or more mental illnesses, from depression and anxiety to personality disorders. He describes CPTSD as a good one. However, occasionally he likes a challenge and will target people who don't fit this type. He seems to gain satisfaction and a sense of pride out of being able to break these people, but he describes himself as lazy, so generally would prefer not to have to put that much effort in. He doesn't just manipulate people to get things he wants out of them, he actively encourages them to harm themselves. He says many of them harmed themselves before meeting him, and every single one of them did so after. Ideally, they'd even go as far as taking their own lives, but it'll settle on them developing addictions or an ED. Quote, If they do get really physically or emotionally sick from this, I would love to taunt their loved ones about it. I would have isolated them from them too, of course, so that the next time they see one another, the physical changes could be jarring. I'd make offhand comments about any changes, nonchalantly. I'd really love to rub it in their faces, openly, what I've done and how good it made me feel, and how incompetent, useless and deserving of abuse their loved one is. To quote another answer, It's something that I seek to do because I like to thoroughly destroy other people, physically and psychologically. I want the other person completely subjugated and broken down, dependent and with zero agency or self-worth. To me, that is hot. It's beautiful. It's proper for them to realise how utterly inferior in every way they are in comparison to me. To have them abuse themselves and worship me. The only validation that they will ever receive is from me. I shall become the lens through which they see everything within and without. I am the interface through which they even know that they are alive. I adore causing and witnessing the transformation of a decently hopeful and happy person with a future and plans and idiosyncrasies into a pathetic, defeated and numb slave eager to do whatever humiliating or painful thing that I demand. In response to a question asking about how sadists feel about the fact that they derive pleasure from seeing others in pain, Andrew made it clear that he feels no guilt and doesn't view his perception of the world in a negative light. In fact, he believes it makes him superior. He clearly has a god complex, as he said prior to this that when he looks in the mirror, he sees an amazing specimen of humanity, describing himself as a literal god against man. Between the ages of seven to nine, his enjoyment that derived from others' pain, their fear and gore in general, began to turn in nature, and it seems that he is now at a point where only these morbid topics make him feel something in that way. When he was a child, he learnt to hide these interests from others, as they clearly didn't feel the same as he did, and he realised that he was different, and there was no benefit revealing what he was truly like. He seemingly only does so now because he can remain anonymous on the internet, and I believe he gets a kick out of the reactions he gets when he talks about how callous he is. It's like boasting for him. Where most people would enjoy praise for their accomplishments, he prefers to see a reaction of shock and disgust from others. He thrives off the idea of being taboo. 
By this point, I think it's becoming very clear what an immoral, heartless and sadistic individual Andrew is, but it gets so much worse. He doesn't just gain pleasure out of psychologically abusing, manipulating and gaslighting people, but actually physically harming them too. He revealed that his favourite fantasies involve home invasion, abduction, murder, torture, SA, cannibalism, inappropriate activities with corpses, disembowelment, the list goes on. Which his favourite is at any given time varies depending on his mood, and they constantly evolve, but the aforementioned topics are frequently present. He also likes the idea of having a partner in crime, either male or female, preferably male, he is bi by the way, and he says that they would have to prove themselves and be as sadistic as him, if they showed any weakness or empathy, they wouldn't be a good fit. He would still like to be the dominant partner, and while he sees the appeal of having a partner who is already an established serial killer, he would prefer someone who is new to it all, who he could guide through it and show them how to maximise the personal fulfilment they gain from it. Andrew admits to harming countless animals when he was younger, though he hasn't done it for years and probably won't again unless it was out of boredom, because he basically became desensitised to it by the age of 16. It didn't really do anything for him anymore, and he wanted to move on to bigger things, so to speak. This is extremely concerning, because we all know that harming animals as children is a common behaviour for serial killers, and he shows no remorse for what he did, just as he shows no remorse for the harm he's caused as an adult. When it comes to humans, he hasn't just fantasised about harming people, he claims to have actually done so. He appears to specifically enjoy harming people he's in a relationship with, at least he hasn't mentioned attacking random people. Perhaps he deems that too risky, as if he has been successful in manipulating a partner, they're less likely to report him to the police or anyone else, so the chances of him facing any consequences are lower than if he assaulted someone who he hasn't had the chance to psychologically abuse. Quote, Every relationship I've had thrives in a thoroughly grey area with regards to consent, and I wouldn't want it any other way. Aside from the aforementioned traits that would make someone easier to manipulate, Andrew isn't picky about the type of person he would like to harm or abuse in whatever way. He doesn't care what gender they are, what age, yes, that includes children, even whether they're alive or not. He has spoken about his desire to have inappropriate contact with a corpse, even that of a child, who, preferably, he had assaulted and tortured before murdering them, and when he's done with all that, he'd eat them. He doesn't define himself as a pedophile because he isn't exclusively attracted to children, though it's a common misconception that peas are only into children. Many are into people of all ages, including children, so I'd absolutely say that he is one, considering he says his fantasies involve babies, toddlers and children up to the age of 14, and that these sometimes appeal to him more than adults, and in a different way. He also highlights that he isn't into children at all if the fantasy is not sadistic in nature. I don't think that would disqualify him from being classed as a P though. He has no moral boundaries, and his sole motivation is the contentment he derives from seeing others suffer, or inflicting damage in one way or another. He doesn't harm out of hatred or rage, in fact he says he has never even felt rage, and doesn't think he's felt hatred either. He acts out of a compulsion that most people, myself included, can't even begin to understand. Andrew has admitted to various types of psychological abuse, various types of physical abuse, including SA, and he's even hinted that he's murdered people on a couple of occasions. One of these sounds like it could be a joke. It was in response to a question asking, how many bodies do you have? And he responded, how many bodies do I have? What is this, some kind of jerk? Human bodies or animal bodies, and who's asking? I don't have any bodies of anything on me, but I vaguely know where several of them may be. They're likely not in any fit state to entertain anyone at the moment though, and they're probably, definitely, not in one piece anymore either. The use of emojis in this answer, and the tone in general, suggests that he is joking, but at this point, how sure can we be? especially considering we know he has a paraphilia for murder. He has admitted that he wouldn't hesitate to commit murder if he knew he could get away with it, and it's blatantly obvious that he has no moral compass, so who knows. 
His answers are very honest and matter of fact, and he has incriminated himself numerous times, but perhaps he wouldn't be stupid enough to admit to murdering someone if he had actually done that. As there's always a limit to how anonymous you can be on the internet, even when using a fake name and revealing no personal details about yourself. So it's up to you whether or not you believe Andrew has acted on these fantasies, the detail that goes into these answers leaves no doubt in my mind that he is a very deranged individual, and I think he is guilty of many crimes. But I don't really actively believe he has killed anyone. There was a comment on one of Andrew's answers which sparked a lengthy conversation that is as close as we'll get to an interview with him. It's quite interesting and provides further psychological context, so I'll quote some of it here. Sadism isn't a choice, but you can choose to be a lot more ethical than this. I appreciate the rawness and honesty, but subtly suggesting suicide, encouraging self-harm, exploit traumas, don't you have any ethical limits? I don't, actually. I don't go and do whatever I want, though, because that would be really stupid and would just get me caught. I do what I think I can get away with, and maybe just a slight bit more. What do you think is wrong with you, assuming you have thought about that? I'm assuming you mean mentally. I'm not sure. I've wondered. I'm sure you've seen the other commenter here had asked if I was a narcissist. I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure if it's the best fit, though. Someone else did an informal assessment on me in DMs and came to the conclusion that I'm a psychopath. Who knows, but it seems like a better fit than narcissist. I just go with sadist because that's pretty obvious. Everything else is speculation. Maybe I'm totally normal, but just a sadist. When I was eight, I was diagnosed with conduct disorder, but that's the only assessment I've had. Not every narcissist is a sadist, and not every sadist is a narcissist. They both can show similar behaviours. Narcissists gaslight, manipulate, control, like you do too. But they're both driven by different things. The silent treatment, for example. Sadists use it because the neediness and anxiety it causes gives them pleasure, while narcissists often use it to punish. So motive is really important. Are you even able to feel any kind of remorse or empathy? Do you look down on your victims for being weak or needy? Do you have contempt for them? Yeah, I don't think that narcissist is the most accurate either. I think sadist gets at it better. I'm not filling some hole in me or some need for validation, some hidden low self-worth. I'm actually very arrogant and it's not a front. I'm just very entitled. Neediness and anxiety for sure. Punishment is a much lower priority and it is only used to mould behaviour. I'm a lot more about the actual suffering and emotional distress than teaching them a lesson because I feel wronged in somewhere. I've never felt remorse of any sort for anything I've ever done throughout my life. Empathy, I'm not sure. I can understand what people are feeling, no problem. It's not hard for me to tell and to read it. How could I enjoy hurting them if I couldn't? And to manipulate them, it's essential. But if you mean do I actually care for others or feel for them in a sympathetic way, not at all. Do I look down on them, vaguely? I think mild contempt is a good way to put it. None of it is really a strong feeling or even easily identifiable. It's fairly neutral. Intellectually, I definitely look down on them and see myself as being vastly superior, but it's not really an emotion as much as it is an intuitive thought. I like that they are weak and needy. I like to bring that out of them. I think that it lies at the heart of most other people, which makes them inferior in comparison with me, but I like it because I like to exploit it. So it is purely the emotional distress as a result of you discarding them that you enjoy, or does it feed your ego as well? After all, they give you attention, and they want yours, and the more you're not giving it to them, the more they crave it. Doesn't that play a role at all? Have you ever genuinely cared for another person in general? Family, friends, maybe a pet even? I think so. It's the pain that I'm usually responding to. The confusion, betrayal, anguish, all of that, and the fact that I'm responsible. The more that they want me, the more that I won't give in. But that's not directly to get more attention for attention's sake, but it's about the desperation and pain which are a huge turn on. It's hot to see the debasement and to know that it's because of me. Maybe there's a bit of ego there, but it's really hard to tell. I just feel high on it. 
And no, I can't actually think of anyone or anything that I ever genuinely cared for. If you mean selflessly, and it not just being about me enjoying their company. If it would mean that I could get away with killing and torturing them, but I wouldn't act on it, then no. Do you always prey on the typical weak and naive type that is easy to manipulate? Always girls? You never became attached to their neediness and pain responses once they decided to go no contact. I can imagine when you crave their pain as much as they crave your attention, they may have grew some kind of attachment to that as well. No, not always females. I'm actually more attracted to guys, but I f*** them both. I do tend to go for weak people. I just read the trauma in them like it's written on them plain to see. There's a certain type of person who you can just tell has been f***ed. And people who already self-harm. People pleasers. There are so many people like this that I have no interest in working on the stronger ones. I'm not some stubborn hero. I love to kick them when they're down and I'm actually a bit lazy. The stronger ones I'd like more time with, more intense control. I'd probably have fun breaking them for sure, but I'd really want to up the physical torture and have complete control over them. Like have them imprisoned and getting raped and tortured every day. Put them through a lot of mind f***ery, use drugs on them, altered states of consciousness, intermittent and unpredictable reinforcement and punishment. Sometimes be really nice and act like everything is completely normal, despite the mutilation and dismemberment, and the fact that they can't leave, just f*** with their perception and value system, etc. I do crave the pain and neediness for sure, but enough of them keep coming back and I can bring in new ones relatively often. Yeah, it is addicting. Maybe some kind of sick attachment mixed with mild contempt and amusement. Like they know that I own them, and they are so stupid and pathetic that they still can't quit me. I can tell them exactly what I'm doing and they still accept it. I've had two of them shoot themselves and one hang, and that was such a high. Yeah, they are gone and beyond my reach, but that is such an ultimate surrender and display of pure inferiority and inescapable pain, it almost makes up for it. Hopefully that will remain nothing but a sadistic fantasy. Do you feel like you're in control of your urges? I do feel in control. I have a very high self-control and I'm not impulsive at all. Your self-control would be a lot more effective if it would go hand in hand with a moral compass and ethics. Unfortunately, you don't seem to have either of those. In a way, that's true, but I don't think that you're getting at self-control. You're just getting at not hurting people non-consensually. Self-control is what stops me from attacking random people on the street or from following whatever cruel impulse pops into my brain. I have a lot of self-control and I'm pretty careful about how and when I act. The only reason why you don't practice self-control when it comes to hurting people the way you do is because you have no moral compass. So yes, your ability to practice self-control would be more effective if you chose not to hurt people that way despite your urges. A lot of sadists have such a moral compass, but you seem to think that the whole world revolves around your pleasure and desires, even when you choose not to hurt, kill, r torture, whatever, someone, because it might make you end up in prison. And you're proud of the path of destruction that you leave behind, as if you're any better than the people you consider to be weak and pathetic, but you're just as much of a slave to your feelings and urges as they are, desperately preying on potential victims in an effort to make them tell you their story just so you can off to it. The difference is that your urges do not cause you to self-destruct but only destruct others. And the only reason why is not because you're mentally stronger but because you're probably born with a brain dysfunction that causes you not to feel any compassion, which is nothing but an unfortunate biological accident. You say that I have no moral compass like it's a bad thing. Ultimately, the world does revolve around my pleasure and desires for a couple of reasons. I am myself, not anyone else. I only live my own life and I'm only responsible for my own pleasure and well-being. And when you don't have a moral compass, as you do eloquently put it, you can basically do whatever you want to people without penalty save for getting caught. So why not? I'm just made differently. That doesn't make me less than anyone else. I restrain myself pretty easily from taking action in whatever way I want, so I choose my behaviour. I'm not compelled to do shit. 
I choose to because it feels good, but I can put off gratification as well, no problem. Probably born with a brain dysfunction that causes you to not feel any compassion. What are you talking about? I'm brain damaged now. I'll take it. What's it to me? I am whatever it is that I am. An unfortunate biological accident. Why an accident? Maybe I was meant to be born that way. It's working out quite well for me after all. I love what I am. This makes me sound like an alien. Nope, still human last time I checked. An accident would imply deviation from a plan. I don't believe that there is any plan. Some people are just more compassionate than others. No biological f**ups required. There are a couple more comments before Andrew stops replying, but they don't really add anything else of value, so I'll leave them out. I really wish the other commenter had asked about Andrew's childhood, as that's a missing piece of the puzzle here. We know his interests in sadistic topics began at a very young age, and that he started harming animals during childhood too. I wonder if there was a specific event that triggered all this, like abuse, or a generally neglectful upbringing, or if he was just born that way. I read all 58 of his answers and didn't notice any details about his upbringing or his family, so it's impossible to speculate on this. I'd also be intrigued to know more about his personal life now. Does he have a family that he's in contact with, or friends, and if so, are they aware of any of this? What is his job? Does he intend to get married and have children one day, and if so, would he be able to suppress his dark side when the time came? I still have so many questions, but overall this has been quite a comprehensive dive into the mind of an extreme sadist. I've covered a few internet users in the past who have had similar interests, but I don't think any have been quite as candid and open as this man in a relatively believable way. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and theories in the comments, plus any other suggestions of disturbing internet users you'd like me to cover. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking and subscribing. Huge thank you to my channel members, whose names are on screen now. I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next Thursday in a new video.